So if you're looking like this out on the pickleball court, there's a chance that you're a tennis player fresh off your, for your 78 foot court and you came to give pickle a try. The transition from tennis to pickle can be a very tricky one, but don't worry, I'm here to help. In this video, I'm gonna give you six things that you need to focus on to make this process super simple. We're gonna break these six things up into three categories. The first two are gonna be things that you're just gonna leave on the tennis court. They have no place in pickleball, so they're gonna be tennis habits that we're gonna to totally leave behind. The next two are gonna be tennis things that we're gonna bring with us to the pickleball court, but we're gonna to have to tweak them a little bit. And then the last two are gonna be things that you've probably never done on a tennis court, and they're gonna be a new feel for you. So they're gonna be kind of new shots, new techniques that we're gonna to have to learn. So let's get into it. Hey guys, so I really appreciate you checking out the video. If you could do me a massive favor and please subscribe to the channel. It helps the algorithm, it helps me reach a wider audience, and in turn, that's gonna help me bring more great content to you guys. Okay, so first we're gonna focus on two things that may work great on the tennis court, but they don't have much of a place in the pickleball court. So we're gonna try to train these out of our repertoire ASAP. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna focus on is our tennis volleys. So in tennis, we're taught to have an open face, we're taught to have a slightly high to low motion, and we're taught to make a nice big step into the ball. All of those things with the goal of creating some underspin on the volley. Now in pickleball, really none of those things apply. Underspin, on, especially on a volley, doesn't do a whole lot of good for us because it's gonna tend to float the ball or pop the ball up more, okay? So in pickleball, there's gonna be no step. We're gonna learn to volley from a, a square stance. Number two, we're gonna learn to volley with a more square paddle face and learn to have a more square motion through the ball. So rather than a high to low, we're gonna have square paddle face and a, a level kind of punch through the ball. So it's gonna look here on the backhand, here on the forehand, rather than our tennis volleys, which are more that style. Okay, so the second thing that we're gonna try to kind of leave behind on the tennis court is in general what I would refer to as big swings. And we'll talk specifically about backswing and follow through. So let's talk about backswing first. In tennis, you've got a 78 foot court, you got a longer court, you got a heavier ball, you got a heavier racket, and we've got to hit the ball farther, which means we've got to create more energy. So for all those reasons, we've got to get this heavy racket, some, some momentum, and we got to get through this heavy ball and we got to hit it far. So there's definitely a need in tennis for a little bit bigger, loopier backswings. In pickleball, we've got a shorter court, we got a smaller paddle, we got a lighter ball. It's much easier to create kind of quick bursts of momentum. So for that reason, a general rule that I want you to follow is if I had kind of an imaginary line coming off the side of my body here, we're gonna try to very rarely get the paddle behind that point. There's, there's not many times where we're gonna need that paddle doing anything back here. You can do almost anything you need to do in pickleball with that paddle right at your side and coming through. So this is gonna be our cutoff point and we're gonna try to keep the paddle in front of that at all times. Okay, so let's talk about follow through real quick. Now, follow through is just a product of how fast I swing. The faster I swing, the more my paddle's gonna wanna follow through across my body to the other side. So, if I'm farther away from the net and I'm trying to hit the ball harder, I'm naturally gonna have a little bit of a follow through and that's okay because my opponents are farther away which means it's gonna take longer for the ball to get back to me and I've got a little more recovery time. If I get up to that net, I don't, I can't afford to have that same length of follow through because if I hit that, the ball is gonna get to my opponent and be back to me very quickly and I'm still gonna be in my follow through. So generally my kind of rule of thumb that I want you to follow is if you're at the baseline, you can kind of follow through bigger or however you want. 
as we approach the kitchen line, we're gonna try to cut our follow throughs to not go all the way across our body. We're gonna try to have that follow through stop more or less right in the center of your body so you're ready to swing again. So I wanna take a quick second and give a big thanks to the sponsor of this video, which is Manta Sleep Masks. For me, sleep is really important, especially when I'm on the road, traveling, playing tournaments. Recently, I've been using these Manta Sleep Masks, which are awesome. Really high quality, super lightweight. This one even has a feature where it has built-in like white noise or music that you can play through it so you don't hear those little background noises. But this has been huge for ensuring that I'm getting great sleep no matter what the conditions. So if you're interested in checking these out, check the description below. You'll see a link to uh, Manta's website and you can learn more about these. So now let's talk about a couple things we're gonna bring with us from the tennis court, but we're gonna have to tweak them a little bit. So the first one we're gonna talk about is spin. Now. Spin, if you haven't played a racket sport before, can be a pretty difficult thing to master. It's a difficult thing to kind of feel and understand. So if you come from tennis, or especially a higher level tennis background, and you fully understand how to create topspin, how to create underspin, that is a huge advantage that you wanna to bring to the pickleball court and use as much as possible. Now, how is it different? With a tennis racket, we can really close the face or open the face a lot to create spin because those strings are really gonna bite the ball. They've got a lot of friction and they're gonna bite into the ball. So we can really have a closed racket face when we're hitting and still get the strings to bite and create top spin. Pickleball paddles and pickle balls do not create as much friction. So while the concepts are all the same, we're not gonna be as exaggerated with how much we alter the paddle angle, okay? So if we're hitting topspin, we can maybe close it a little bit, but we can't close it as much as we would in tennis. And the same goes for underspin. So use that spin as much as possible, but understand that a little goes a long way as far as how much we're adjusting those paddle angles. Okay, so for the second thing we're gonna bring from the tennis court, but we're gonna tweak a little bit, is gonna be our ready position, okay? So a lot of things about this are the same. We're gonna have a nice wide base. You're gonna split step before you hit. You're gonna have your paddle, what we call neutral, meaning centered in your body. You're gonna have a good balanced position, okay? All those things are the same. Now, what's gonna be a little bit different is in tennis, we're taught to have it kind of way out in front and a higher ready position which makes sense because in tennis, you know, a lot happens up here. We've got a higher bouncing ball, we've got a bigger court, the ball flies higher. So a lot of times we're doing things that are up here more. In pickleball, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that ready position and we're gonna lower it down to about waist height, okay? So we've still got it centered, but it's gonna be more around waist to belly button height because in pickleball, very rarely do things happen up around chest height. And even if it does, there's a good chance that that ball's going out. The ball doesn't bounce high, um, high balls tend to go out. So 90% of what we do in pickleball is gonna be occurring down here anyway. So there's not a lot of value to having a ready position way up here and just going up and down constantly. We wanna start down here and that, that way as everything happens, we're already kind of down there ready to go. Now there's a little bit of a second part to this that I briefly want to touch on, and that is the takeaway. So we have our ready position. A really common thing you see in tennis players is this kind of loop takeaway. Again, they're creating height in case they have to hit the ball maybe up around shoulder height. Like we said in pickleball, that doesn't really happen. So we're gonna get that ready position lower, but even as we take the paddle back or go for the shot, we're just gonna to try to kind of go straight down to it or straight to the ball. We want to really get rid of the habit of, of doing a kind of an up and down because as things speed up, that extra time can cost you and it's going to cause more errors in a lot of your dinks or drives. Okay, so that brings us to the last two and probably toughest two of this whole process because these last two things are going to be 
things that you've probably never felt on a, on a tennis court before. So they're gonna be totally new feels or totally new shots that we're gonna have to kind of learn from scratch. So for this first one, it's gonna be learning to hit with what we call the tip down. So allowing the face of the paddle, the tip of the paddle to go down below the hand. Now the reason this is kind of foreign because in tennis, we're always taught racket head up. When you volley, we want this nice strong wrist position. When we're taking a ground stroke, we want this cocked wrist. So a lot of the feels in tennis are, we're gonna have this kind of locked in strong wrist position. So when we get to pickleball and I see people dinking, the real common thing I see is we're still trying to create this or this. And it's not necessarily wrong, but there's an easier way to do it. If we allow that tip to go below the hand, you're gonna be a lot more relaxed and you're gonna have actually a lot more options with your shots, whether that be speed up, maybe add a little top spin to your dink. You can do a lot more from that tip down position. So I want you to get comfortable allowing that tip to drop below the hand and it's gonna feel a little bit weird. Okay, so for this last one, we're gonna reference a couple things we already talked about. Number one, way back at the beginning of the video, we talked about we wanna get rid of those tennis volleys. So we talked about replacing it with a kind of a more of a punch volley, but there is another option. And then just in our last segment, we talked, talked about allowing that tip to go down for our dinks and stuff, okay? So now when we combine some of those elements, we're gonna learn what we call a roll volley, okay? So when you're volleying, if you have a ball coming at you slow, if we let the tip of that paddle go down and then you use your feel that you already know from tennis of how to create topspin, how to kind of roll up the back of the ball, we're gonna have a shot called a roll volley, okay? And this is a very important shot in pickleball. So like I said, this combines a lot of the elements that we've talked about, not starting by taking the paddle up too much, having that lower ready position, allowing to get comfortable letting the tip drop. And then from there, you're gonna use your feel that you know of how to create topspin on the ball and get comfortable learning this roll volley because you're gonna find that there is lots of benefits to this shot. That's all I got for you today. Hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to grab your screenshot so next time you hit the court, you have all of this information right at your fingertips.